Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to the B-Ball Breakdown Podcast. I've launched a brand new culture and politics podcast called Can You Hear Me Shaking My Head? I know some of you may want to avoid hearing any political talk at all, but I've been bringing on writers of hit TV shows as well to talk about their process, and the discussions have been really cool. I'd really appreciate it if you popped your head over to the podcast and gave it a listen. Again, it's called Can You Hear Me Shaking My Head? And it's definitely a different version of me you haven't heard. And I think you'll find it equally entertaining and insightful. Will Derrick Rose retire? Who's really the coach of the Cavaliers? What happens once Isaiah Thomas returns? The only question left is, say it with me, you win. Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to the B-Ball Breakdown Podcast. Today I'm pleased to bring on the show Joe Varden, who is the Cavs beat reporter for Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer. And I know he's probably one of the hardest working beat reporters in Cleveland right now. So Joe, thanks for coming on the show. Can't wait to talk some Cleveland Cavaliers with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it and uh, always appreciate your work. So this, this is a good time for me. Well, it's nice for you to say that because it doesn't really feel that way from a lot of the Cavs fans. I don't know if they really like me <laughs> or they like what I do. And here's, I think I finally figured out the Russ fans and the LeBron fans, when they say that I always crap on them and don't show anything nice, I think it's because Twitter is filtering out some of my tweets. I really do like LeBron, <laughs> but I don't know why. They, you know, Cleveland fans, I think it's safe to say, would you agree with me that they're, they are, they're holding on a little, they're holding on tight to this, I would think. Well, they've had a good thing going, and um, you know I think that 2010 was so traumatic that you just want, uh, from a Cleveland perspective, you just don't want to have to go through that again. So I think that that's where they're coming from. Um, but no, I I see your stuff. I mean, it it just it helps me, <laughs> it helps me to to, to keep a, a beat of what they're doing schematically, and and actually helps inform me what you know when it's time for me to ask Ty about something they're doing from an X's and O's perspective. So good or bad, I, I appreciate the clip. So you brought up Ty Lu, and I thought maybe we can broach the subject of, you know, LeBron James and Ty Lu as the coach-player relationship. It seems like of all the, the those relationships in the NBA, this one could be the most, I, I suppose the word is complicated? Um, no, I, I don't think complicated is it. I, I think that, um, that Ty has uh, has pushed LeBron in a way that LeBron is is probably not used to and and certainly not this early in a season um, you know that I thought especially when things weren't going so well with this team um, that Ty was especially critical and otherwise just non um, just just not very supportive of LeBron publicly and I think he was chiding him privately um, to the point where LeBron bristled at it um, but, you know, I think that LeBron still considers Ty to be a player's coach um, and, and a good coach. And, you know, you know I, I've kicked these tires hard and it's not it's just not there. It's, it's, there isn't anything beyond um, just the stress of, a, of an early season losing streak. And, you know, the fact that Ty is applying pressure to LeBron. Uh, but, but LeBron has responded. He's, he's playing great. He's. He, he is, and, and now he's even, I think, starting to defend a little bit, which uh, was not happening earlier this year. So um, I, I, think they're, I think they're okay. When you said that he, he was getting on him and being tough on him in private and in, in the press, do you, do you mean, I guess that means defensively, right? Because you couldn't argue with what he's doing on the offensive side. Well, for the most part, yes. Uh, for the most part, this was a defensive issue and an effort issue, um, and Ty was demanding more from LeBron, but... There was uh, a game, and now it's going to escape me who it was that they were playing, but not, not too – it wasn't too far in the past. It was during this winning streak where uh, LeBron had eight at, at halftime and he had bricked a dunk and then threw up a couple of bad shots, and Ty challenged him at halftime to just simply play better, to take better shots, to be more aggressive, which is a cliche, and I hate it, but in this case it was true. You know, he said that LeBron was, you know, met, told him that LeBron was messing around with the game. 
Um, and that really got LeBron's goat and who came out in the, in the third quarter in a different pair of shoes uh, and played great the, the rest of the night. So um, I think, you know, if you go back to when Ty took over in January of 2016, uh, one of the things that he promised to do was hold LeBron accountable. And he has done it. Um, he did it that season when they ended up winning it all. If you, everybody knows the story about Game 7 at halftime. Ty screaming at LeBron that we have to, that he needs to do more, and, and Ty and LeBron being furious with him over it. But then he came out and played that great second half. Um, you know, this year everything from LeBron needs to be in better shape to LeBron's got to defend. Um, you know, it's it's been all over the map. So uh, you got to give Ty uh, credit, I think, for that part of, of his job, which is he has stuff to his guns on LeBron. Okay, that's good to know. I'm always curious about that because it seems like we've seen little inklings here and there across the board on every team that LeBron's played on where he kind of gets into the coaching, you know, realm a little bit. And by the way, I don't think I blame the guy. He's probably has the highest IQ of any player in the NBA and deserves that, that role of being, you know, not a player coach, but certainly a lot of input. So I'm always curious, you know, exactly how these things play out. Who is, really in charge, but it's safe to say that like Tyron Lue definitely has the range of this team. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, he does. And, and I thought, um, when, when they were, when they had lost four in a row and five and six, uh, in October and early November, and you, you're thinking about, well, they had gone to three finals. They were expected to get there and lose this year. Um, you know, the sort of the, all the conditions were ripe to maybe have the players tune out the coach. But I think, what you really had happen was Ty understanding the, the duration of, a, of a, an NBA season and how long it is, especially when you make it as far as the Cavs do. And so he was kind of giving his players a certain amount of room. Um, and it does, it just goes back to he is a player's coach. Um, you know, I think that there are times where you can argue with what he does rotation wise. Um, although not lately, but but throughout his career here, you could say that. And certainly some X's and O's that there have been questions at times. But um, you know, he he does seem to understand how it, how how it is to be a player, and he applies that to the way he coaches the team. And I think for the most part, it works. Well, you know, this the streak is now in nine games. And as I'm digging into the numbers and the lineups and everything like that, uh, I can't help but notice that almost the exact time when the streak starts is coincides with Derrick Rose, you know, not playing and maybe even separating himself from the team. Uh, I can't overlook that as a coincidence. Can you? Yeah, I see. I, I think I can. And, and uh, you know... I, I'm not sure um, what numbers you, that you're looking at right now that that you know maybe I haven't seen. But um, the, my view of this is first first of all, Ty set up a rotation that was kind of separate from whoever was playing point guard, and he said, "Listen, no matter who I have playing the starting point, this is what I'm going to do with the other nine guys." And Dwayne Wade is going to play the backup point. He's going to play in closing time. And he's going to play with, with Corver and Jeff Green. Um, and this is, how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to use JR. This is how I'm going to use LeBron. And it doesn't matter who is playing point guard with, with this first unit when that game starts. I'm going to do these things with the rest of the guys. And that's how we're going to roll. So from that perspective, I, I don't think you could say, well, it's because Derrick Rose has been out um, because he would be doing mostly what Jose Calderon is doing right now, uh, ostensibly. Um, I, 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 think that that, I think there's something to that. I also think, in fairness to Derrick, he, he had two good games to start the year and then got hurt, and he never really recovered. And so when he came back, he wasn't the same player. Um, and his last two games were horrendous. You know, he had uh, something like eight or ten turnovers and only a couple assists, and he was a mess. He was eight of twenty-one shooting, and and so I, I mean, if, if he were healthy and playing, I think they would probably be about there. But but to me, it has much more to do with Ty deciding 
we're going to play a certain way with the other guys and, and just make point guard, you know, almost be a move, you know, kind of move who's there. One way to make Derrick Rose feel better and more welcome to the team is to buy him flowers. And there is no better deal out there than going to proflowers.com. Thinking of sending a greeting card for the holidays? Everybody does that, and your card will be shoved behind Aunt Jean and Uncle Steve's on the mantle. Sending a bouquet is much more memorable, their flowers are gorgeous, and you'll get prime real estate on their dining room table. I just got some beautiful flowers five days ago, and their colors continue to get more and more radiant. More importantly, it brought a smile to my wife's face. So don't get the same old, same old traditional gift. Fly down that proverbial chimney with some candy cane roses or their classic mini Christmas tree that comes with lights and ornaments. No matter what you choose, you'll get 20 bucks off any order of $29 or more by using my code BBALL at checkout. That's B-B-A-L-L. These beauties are guaranteed to stay fresh. So head over to proflowers.com, use my code BBALL, and be the real Santa this year. And here's what I'll throw out there. The, the first, through the first uh, games before the streak, the first 12 games of the season, you know, the, the lineup that had Jay Crowder, LeBron James, Kevin Love, Derrick Rose, and J.R. Smith, the, the starters, they were, yeah. getting, they were getting blown out, negative 17.6 net rating. I mean, it was not good. And primarily, yeah. and by the way, it wasn't the offense. They were scoring really well, but they were just getting destroyed on the defensive end. And when you take that lineup and you put Calderon in there, it goes from 128 uh, as a defensive rating to um, 100. <laughs> and, and so yeah. all of a sudden, and I, by the way, I do see there are some positional things that Calderon does better, like on the weak side, that Rose just has never really been great at. Uh, and that's helped. But I'm just kind of curious because even aside from the whole um, on-court stuff that we're seeing, like what is, what is the deal? What is happening here? Is he going to retire? Is he going to play again this year? What's, what's happening with Derrick Rose? Yeah, I mean, th- there isn't any uh, update, uh, at least from the Cavs, um, that, that I was able to get today. You know, I did ask. Um, but when you, look at, when you look at Derek, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Th- there are three things. He's hurt a lot. That's frustrating. He doesn't really seem to have a, uh, a place on this team. Because um, when you look, about, look at it, you know, Isaiah Thomas is almost back, and then Dwayne is playing so well in his role that I don't see how you could move Dwayne out of that role to put Derek there. Um, so he's, he's, he doesn't know where he fits, and I think that has a lot to do with this. And then the third thing is the money. I mean, LeBron and some others have said, well, you can't put a price on happiness and we want Derek to be happy, and that's fine. But $80 million, that, that is generational money that takes care of Derek's children and their children. It's, so it's, it's hard to imagine him walking away from that. Um, so the Cavs have said they expect him back. He was out indefinitely anyway with an injury, so I don't think there's urgency on their side of it. And you know, I, just, I think that Derek has to get to a place where he is either comfortable coming back or he can convince the Cavs to try to move him, you know, understanding that his value is very low. Um, but I, I, I just struggle with, you know the idea that he wouldn't that he would never play again okay that well, that's good to hear because you never like to you know see that and, and i get it i feel like yeah he must be more frustrated than anybody by the the injuries what is the injury that's holding him out right now so it's complications from a sprained left ankle um he he sprained it october 20th in the fourth quarter against milwaukee he was he was as i mentioned he was having a nice night uh, and he was early in the fourth, and he was going to the hole, and Greg Monroe kind of grabbed him around the neck um, in midair, and, and Derek fell, you know, really poorly on that ankle and turned it, and um, I think he missed three to four games after that, came back, um, and just wasn't, just didn't have the same lift, the same explosion, um, and it was at that time, you know, when Derek came back that they really... They, like the blowouts were coming, and it was they were coming hard and fast. And um, you know, I mean, I, I think that has something to do as well with those horrendous defensive numbers. Because I think if you think about it, you know, his first two games with the Cavs, they held both of those opponents uh, under a hundred, um, and then the losing streak hit, and that's where they were giving up 115 
or more a night and just getting blown out. And, and that's when the starters had a lot to do with that. Fair enough. You know, and that's right. We, we do need to be uh, careful of the, the uh, small sample size theater going on. That said, it is, and for him it is because he's only played in a, set, in a few of those games, but I, we are getting to the 20th game, 21st game of the year, which is, you know, a quarter of the way, so we, we're starting to get a picture, right, like, of something. But um, I could see also why, you know, he's out, they're winning now. That must, be, uh, that must be painful as well as a player to, like, see that and think, oh, was it, how are they doing this without me and maybe they don't need me? I guess that's sort of the other coin, right, other side of the coin. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I believe that that has as much or more to do with this than simply frustration over being hurt. You know, I just, he knew, he knew that Isaiah Thomas was supposed to be the starter, so he knew that he was coming in to be the backup. But when he signed here, there was no Dwayne Wade on the table. And then even when they brought Dwayne in, um, I don't know how much discussion there was about Dwayne being the full-time backup point. And, of course, Dwayne ended up starting at the beginning of the year. So, so it didn't bother Derek. Like, like Dwayne's presence wouldn't have bothered Derek at all. He was happy to have him. And then Derek's season goes the way it does. And then, oh, by the way, here comes Dwayne Wade. And he's, he's almost, I mean, do you want to say perfect for this role? I, I mean, he's, he's really good in this role. And it's just. I don't know how Derek could have possibly imagined them moving Dwayne out of it. So then what do you do with Derek? Yeah, and I don't know. It's safe to say that Derek probably has zero trade value as well. So that's not going to be a possibility. Right. That's what, that's what you would think. So, well, how have Wade and Rose gotten along? Has that been a, a smooth transition uh, when Wade came on the team? Yeah, I mean, you know, they said all the right things um, that of, you know, when – Back in those earlier days, I mean, Derek was probably among the most vocal in terms of supporting the idea of Dwayne coming and playing alongside him. Um, you know, I mean, it was a it was a, a tough transition to kind of bring really all these guys, but certainly Wade, uh, into the fold because it dramatically changed the team. You know, they had gone to three straight finals with roughly the same set of players. And, of course, Kyrie was gone, which is a huge, huge thing. Um, but, but a number of the players were gone. You know, Richard Jefferson's gone. James Jones retired. Um, Delhi from, from the first two finals is gone. I mean, just it, it, you go on and on. And so uh, the players who were still here but were going to play less or maybe have their roles impacted, like a J.R. Smith, um, like, uh, you know, Channing Fry guys like that um, were not super thrilled with, with like watching their playing time go away for somebody like Dwayne who was coming in and maybe was at, at the end of his career. And it, it took a while. Um, but now, you know, obviously there's, there's much more harmony and don't mean to say everything's great, but uh, it's getting better from a off the court perspective and, and Dwayne's just playing fantastic. So it's hard to argue with what they see. Sure. I mean, you know, winning hides a lot of stink, as they say. And uh, that's certainly, I mean, it's, I, I'm surprised even, I would have thought that the locker room was going okay. But I think we can't overlook the value of a guy like Richard Jefferson and Champ on, the, on that team that would keep those guys uh, in line. Not, I don't know if in line is the right term, but they'd keep them, you know, whatever that term is to get along with everybody, right? Like that seems like that's a real value that maybe people don't even recognize these days. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, this is a point that I had made before, um, but because of the addition of Durant uh, in Golden State, that, that, of course, had changed everybody's calculus, and it really, <laughs> it probably put a ceiling on the Cavs, e- even though they were, and, and maybe still are, um, the team that's closest to them. Uh, it, it just, it, it, it made the possibilities of repeat championships almost remote, certainly with the guys that they had. And so a realization that players not named LeBron and maybe not named Kevin Love, although they tried to move him too, but, but basically almost any role player on the Cavs needed to understand that things had to change in Cleveland so they could try to make a run at these Warriors. And so, yeah, that means bringing in players like Dwayne and, and you know, you, you made this big trade with, with, bringing Isaiah and Crowder, but, but the idea is, is that 
roles were going to change and faces were going to change so you can try to close that gap. And, and that sounds good when you do it in August, but then when everybody shows up at training camp and you see that roles are different and guys aren't playing and the locker room vibe is different and, and Richard Jefferson gets traded, that makes for some rocky, rocky moments and, and you know, compound that with the losing. It, it was, this was a tough group to be around there for the first two or three weeks. Wow. Well, is Kevin Love still being shopped? I don't think so. I, I, I really don't. And I'm not sure that they had shopped him since, you know, those those deadline uh, or those uh, draft night deals that we have all we'd all heard about um, came and went. You know, he I in, in my view, he's having a, he's having a good season. He's had some nights where he's disappeared, but he's playing the five. Um, when you look at most of his matchups against like Drummond and, and Dwight Howard and, and then uh, Whiteside the other night, for the most part, Kevin's come out way ahead. Um, he got he had a really bad night against Embiid uh, on Monday, but everybody else kind of backed him up. So, you know, 18.7 points and 10 rebounds is, is, is really good for him. Um, so I think that – I think they will try to add – uh, this by the trade deadline without moving Kevin. And I think if they do that, um, that gives you a chance. Fair enough. Now, the in this streak, the biggest minute difference uh, among the roster and among the players was Channing Fry is getting 10 more minutes a game. And I'm curious because I feel like he had fallen off the edge of the earth even into last year's playoffs and was just simply yeah. not a factor. And I don't – I. I was around in the conference finals. I don't remember him being necessarily injured or something, but for whatever reason, what do you think all of a sudden reminded Tyron Lue that they have a, a sharpshooter at the five that makes it really difficult to guard them when he's in? Yeah, I mean, they feel like Channing is, a, is not good against the Warriors, and they didn't play him in the 2016 finals when they won. Um, and they also, of course, didn't play him last year in the finals. And then... You know, it's it's what we said with all these guys they brought in this year. Channing was the odd man out, and at some point during training camp, Ty told him, "You're not going to play." Um, and then Tristan gets hurt, and you know Derrick Rose is gone, and all of a sudden there are spots, and so Ty turns to Channing, and he's been he's been pretty good since they turned to him, um, and and that you know brings us to this point. I, I reported today that that they are looking at next week for Tristan Thompson to come back, which is going to makes for a whole bunch of decisions about when you play Tristan and, and where do you play him and what happens to Jay Crowder and then what happens to Channing Fry. Um, he does provide that extra floor spacing on that second unit, but he's also been a guy this year who's been able to run in there and get a rebound and kind of stand and clog things up in the middle. Um, you know, Ty has said Channing needs to play. Well, okay, but if you do that, then you're going to have to play 10 guys or you're going to have to take a guy like Jay Crowder, who you really valued, and, and not play him. Um, I guess the third option would be to not play Tristan, but I just don't, I don't see that. I think they're actually going to start him when he comes back. Wow. Okay. Well, because here's the interesting thing, and, and I agree. I still feel like well, they've shored up the pick and roll when Love is involved in it, where the teams yeah. are just literally – They'll just call out whoever loves playing, and they just run them in a pick and roll. And it's been been really problematic for them. But um, I can't help but look at the the one lineup across the board that's done as well as any and has played the most in the last nine games is is uh, LeBron and Wade alongside Kyle Korver, Jeff Green, and Channing Fry. And it's they're destroying teams in their four minutes a game over the eight games they played together. So. It's like flashing big in my brights here. It, you got to got to ride that lineup as much as you can, I would think. Um, and that goes to the next thing: is what I don't recognize Jeff Green. Who is this Jeff Green that's playing for the Cavs? It's not the guy that I've seen the last eight or nine years. What happened? How? What? What do they do? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're not the only one who has who has made that observation. Um, I mean, just kind of league insiders. When, when Jeff came and, and early on in training camp just said just to watch out for him that he disappears and and that that's not happened and I don't know how much of it is tied because when you when you look back um, when Jeff had the heart issue in Boston Ty was an assistant there and one of Ty's main assignments that year was to 
from a basketball perspective, nurse Jeff Green back to health. And so they've got this tremendous relationship. Ty wanted Jeff Green here, and so Ty maybe has unlocked something. But but Jeff is, you know, I guess the other thing is when you think about what they were doing in Boston and then certainly in Orlando, um, he was playing big starters minutes, playing against frontline guys and getting lost in some nights. And now it's almost like what they're doing with Wade you know, Jeff and Green and, and Dwayne Wade are spending large portions of their playing time against backups, and they're better than backups. And so it could be as simple as winning their individual matchups, playing alongside a LeBron James and Kyle Korver, getting open looks, and, uh, and just getting room to run uh, and get to the hole, which, which both of those players have. I mean, in Dwayne's perspective, playing with the point guard, I think, has created some matchup problems, too. But, but Jeff's been great, and he's been athletic, and he has very seldom disappeared. I can think of one or two games out of the 21 they've played where that's been the case. Otherwise, he's been very solid and a, and a huge uh, contributor so far. Yeah, and by the way, we've seen this Jeff Green. We've seen him tantalize us with great play and even stretches of great play. So I'm not quite sold yet, but... But you, you make a very good point. He's doing it. They're putting him in a situation where he can beat up on these, you know, seventh or eighth men who, you know, are a lot easier to score on. And, you know, he's because I still see the same kind of and by the way, I'm no problem against off foot layups and awkward stuff. And he's always sort of done that. And I've never been convinced he meant to do that. But uh, all I can tell you is that he's he's come in and he's really he is that spark. It's really just uh, it's actually good to see him happy to see him have some success. And uh, and certainly the, that triumvirate of Corver, Green, and um, and um, Fry, you know, has just been like you know the most improbable three man, you know, three amigos you're going to imagine <laughs> this year. Um, and so yeah, so but, so I guess that's the problem with Tristan Thompson coming back and Isaiah Thomas making it back into the lineup. I, I guess that's going to be the issue, right? There not there simply isn't enough playing time. Those guys are going to lose significant minutes, I'd imagine. I, I think so, and I think if. Um Ty doesn't want to talk about this. Um, he doesn't want to talk about what he's going to do in terms of a player perspective. But if you look at his track record, um, he tends to to favor pl- like players and their individual track records over um, lineups that analytics-wise seem to be working. And, and I think a prime example of that last year is he had a lineup – in February, where the shortest guy, I think, was J.R. Smith. He was playing LeBron, J.R., Corver, Derek Williams, if you remember him, <laughs> yep. and uh, and one other guy, I can't remember who it was. And, and in, that, in a small sample size, that lineup was destroying teams. And once, um, you know, they brought in Darren Williams uh, to play the backup point, they tied, like went away from that and never went back to it even though the analytics say otherwise. So, you know, you've got your lineup there that you mentioned earlier. It, it, it is a great lineup. Um, but with Tristan back, you know, that's going to make the calculus difficult for Ty to get back to that lineup. Oh, I agree. And I don't think that Ty Lue is at all um, strange for doing that. I, I sense that a lot of the NBA coaches in the league – you know, don't necessarily study the lineup data. And I think that it's feel and it's foul trouble and it's a lot of different matchup stuff. So I get it. Uh, but, you know, and, and that lets jerks like me, you know, second guess them every time because they don't play those lineups. But, um, <laughs> You know, but I, so I get it. I mean, it's a mile a minute. I was actually talking to another coach yesterday about it where it's like, you know, and I think it's only with experience that you can finally calm your brain because you're, you're thinking about well, which lineup is here and what they're going to call there and what's going to happen next. It can become so overwhelming at every, at every level that uh, I think that if you can zen that out, I think that's what they do. And they're like, all right, I'm just going to go by my gut and, and, and sub people in and, and see how that goes. Um, but it's a problem. I, and it's a good problem to have, I imagine. But it's going to be a problem for them because, I mean, Corver makes them go, right? He's, he really is a, um, a, a magnet out there for the defense. And uh, if he loses his minutes, that's going to be sad for me. Yeah. And I just, I mean, this will be a, an interesting nugget for, for you and, and um, just because of, of your like, kind of area of, of interest and expertise. But I did ask Ty this morning. Um, when Isaiah comes back, what are they going to do offensively? Because just the other night, Ty went into detail about how different they are in terms of what they run this year versus the last three. You know, with Kyrie here, they were a pick and roll team, um, and, you know, spread the floor. 
Now it's much, uh, there's a lot more in the high post, there's dribble handoff, there's catch and shoot, and it's worked great. And Ty said that they're going to go, they're going to do pick and roll. Um, he said they're going to try to keep the other stuff, but Isaiah's a pick and roll player, and so that's what they're going to do. So I envision there being some issues of transition uh, until they get back into a flow of playing that way because they have not done it at all this year. Right. Uh, okay, well, interesting to see. And again, I don't know how that's going to work in the middle of the season with hardly any practice time. Uh, but I guess if you're going to add one thing to your offense or Swift, the pick and roll isn't such a big deal. Everyone you know, can handle that, and that will help. So, uh, Well, I guess at this point, um, so you don't think any trades are imminent. You don't think DeAndre Jordan's coming to Cleveland anytime soon. I just, I, you know, it's hard to put a timetable uh, really on, on any of that. I mean, I don't know that the Clippers are ready to move him this second, uh, I think they would like to see a market materialize. Um, the Cavs have the assets if they want to go get him. Um, you know, I think they would prefer to pay a more reasonable price than, than the Clippers would suggest. But the thing I've been saying about this, Nick, is just before the Cavs do any, anything, they have to see what they have in, in Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. I mean, if he's, if he's the guy, if he can move around like he used to, then you know that that's not a spot you've got to upgrade. But if you can't, then you know maybe you don't consider DeAndre and you go in a different direction. When's he coming back? I I mean he's he's going to be back playing, barring a setback, before they play the Warriors on Christmas for sure. Um, you know I, maybe middle of the month, but I, it's it's coming. Okay, good. I, I, you're right. That's a great point. You got to see what you got there before anything happens. And it's funny because that Nets pick, uh, everyone was thinking, ah, maybe it won't be a top five, top six. I think it's a fifth pick right now if you went by the order of, of the uh, of the records. Uh, and they're they're looking okay uh, at this point. So we'll have to see what the value of that is. Because remember, every game that goes forward, and if the Nets continue to do well, mm -hmm. uh, that you lose a little value there. But Either way, uh, I can't thank you enough, Joe, for coming on here and breaking this stuff down with your insider perspective. It's really great stuff, and uh, can't wait to see what happens with the Cavs as we move forward. All right, thanks for having me. You got it. And don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. Are you in? Are you in, Joe? <laughs> I'm, I'm here, aren't I? <laughs>